All right, everybody. This is Ross, the Fig Boss. Today, we have another Fig interview. We're here with a very special guest, Stephen Biggs. Stephen's an author. Uh, he's been um, a good proponent of figs and trying to spread awareness of such an amazing fruit that we all grow. And he's been um, very educational. That's really been his approach from the beginning. He has a, a podcast and a website. Um, I've been on his podcast a number of times. Um, he's also on his website having all kinds of different fig-related information. He has um, actually fig courses. He has uh, all kinds of winterization tips we're going to talk about today. Actually, that's one of the main things we're going to talk about because Stephen's growing in Canada. and He's in Ontario. So we're going to talk a lot about how to grow figs and how to winterize them in colder places. Steven's website for anybody that's interested is uh, the food garden. Sorry. It's foodgardenlife.com. He also has two books that he wrote on figs, uh, grow figs where you think you can't. And also um, how to grow figs in a cold climate. And so he's been really, this is one of the best people I think to talk about on this, to talk to about this particular topic. And so I'm really happy to have Stephen on. Um, Stephen, thanks for doing this. Uh, why don't you start off by introducing yourself, telling us, you know, how you got into figs and and why you're, you know, you're doing what you're doing. Hey, Ross. Well, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here and appreciate that nice introduction. Mm -hmm. My first exposure to figs was when I was a kid. There was an old guy down the street who had <sighs> okay. a big fig tree in his backyard. Mm. And it grew right over his patio, but he would cover that whole thing every winter with plastic and tarps, put a little heater in there and keep it warm. So that was that was my first exposure to figs. But I really got the fig bug when I was a student. I was doing a co-op placement in the UK at, if you get this, a nursery that had the British National Collection of Figs. And wow. uh, so it was it was kind of a fun summer. And um, they had all sorts of figs. I got to taste lots of figs. And I went home feeling pretty excited about figs. So uh, that, that really got me started. But I didn't really go anywhere with it until I had my own place. All those years that I was living in an apartment, I couldn't really get growing. So it was, as soon as I got mm -hmm. my first house, that's when I really got into figs. And uh, my poor wife, she's still with me, but I think I drove her crazy because I was trying <laughs> all these different ways to get those fig trees to survive through the winter. So we had this little two-bedroom bungalow, and I was packing dormant fig trees into the basement. And uh, and I actually started turning off the heat in one in, in our basement bathroom just so I could pack it full of fig trees every winter. So uh, she thought I was a bit crazy, but hey, we had fig trees, and, and that's how I made it work in the beginning. Wow, that's awesome. So what made you want to write about figs too? Is it really that passion? Um, you have this expertise, so I guess it only makes sense. Um, you've obviously written other books, um, but where does the writing come from? I know you said you worked with, with figs, but did you go to school for writing? Is, is this like, uh, how, how do, where does the education and writing come in? Oh, that's a great question. So I, I went to school for horticulture, studied mm -hmm. horticultural science. But uh, when we had kids, I stayed home to look after the kids. And uh, so I was trying to recreate myself and I started taking journalism courses. And so mm. that's how I got into writing. And then because of that, the, uh, the one time I pitched a magazine about this really cool guy that I'd heard about who was growing figs, not too far from Toronto here. And, uh, and I got the assignment to do an article on figs. And this guy was fascinating. And Adriano... Adriano became my mentor. So if oh people my. might have heard oh. about Adriano's figs in Oakville, Ontario. Yeah. And, and I went to visit him a couple times as I was writing this article about him. And he was just such a generous guy, taught me all sorts of great tricks. And he really inspired me. So that's really what uh, got me into writing about figs, got me really excited about sharing in the beginning, sharing what he was teaching me. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, it's interesting what you pass on to somebody else and then what they do with it. You know, they run with it in some other direction. You didn't even think it was going to be possible. Um, mm -hmm. I, I never met Adriano. I obviously knew much about him um, back in the days of Figs for Fun. Um, 
Mm-hmm. I think Stephen, you were a part of that for uh, a time. Yes. Um, and so Adriana was a well-known figure there and, uh, well, at least of his nursery. And so I think recently, didn't he pass away? Uh, I know that he moved and I'm not sure right now where, where things are at. Mm. Yeah. I think, uh, there was a talk a couple years ago, uh, of his passing. And so, um, he had a huge collection. Is, is there things you could tell us? I'm very curious about the man because I, I know you said he's generous. I've never never talked to him again. I, I never emailed with him. I never went there. Yeah, what was super, it like? So a super fun guy with a good sense of humor. He told me he, he was originally from uh, Portugal. So he told me, if you can speak to me in Portuguese, I'll tell you my best secrets. And, and I couldn't <laughs> really get past saying hello. But, okay. but he taught me a lot. And yeah. uh, he had... When I first met him, he had 300 plus varieties. And I think that grew subsequently because when I was talking to him over the years, he'd say, oh, yeah, I've got another 20 varieties coming from, you know, I forget where. So he was always on the hunt for new things. Wow. So he was just like a kid. He was so excited about these new varieties that were coming. Did he? And, Sorry. and then when it came to overwintering them, he had a, a few different things that he was doing. And, and I'll tell you about those, but I think I cut you off when you were about to ask something. Before we get into the overwintering thing, I'm just so curious about this man now. I had no idea you were going to bring this up. Um, did he ever, did you ever get any figs from Adriana? Did he ever give you any? Yeah. So my favorite fig plant, and it's it's especially special for me now because I think of Adriana whenever, whenever I eat a fig from it. And it's a variety called Capellus which mm. he said that came from where he was from, the uh, the Azores, the islands. And so, um, and it's a great one for around here in Toronto too. So that was one of them. And uh, my Desert King came from him too, and, and a few others. Wow. But those are the two that I, I especially cherish. Wow. Very nice. Very cool. So what were some of the things, Stephen, that you, you learned in terms of winterization from him? Um and of course, I'm sure you've expanded that much further now at this point and uh, have many people that you've talked to over the years now, uh, different parts of Canada, uh, many different cold climates. Uh, give us some of the tips. What are, what's the, um, by the way, why, why should certain people protect their figs and other people don't have to? It, um, there are so many different zones within Canada here. And, and so there are some where the figs, it doesn't get cold enough to cause any dieback or damage through the winter. And then there's other places that are so cold, you just, they die right back to the ground every winter. So um, there's a huge, uh, huge number of different conditions we're talking about. So we can't generalize for the country as a whole. And, um, but when I first went to meet Adriano, I'd had in my mind the two things that I was familiar with at the time was people growing them in pots and then taking those in some kind of protected space for the winter. Or I'd, I'd heard of people burying their figs for the winter. And um, I had this image of people digging like this really deep hole and putting the fig in almost like a grave. So I got to Adriano's and, and he almost laughed at that. He said, oh, there's so many better ways to do it. So the, the one thing that I was really amazed with is he had this beautiful big desert king bush. And it was, it was growing on a little bit of a funny angle, but that's because what he did every winter is he would winch this bush down so it was closer to the ground, and then he'd put a big insulated A-frame right over the top. And, and this A-frame was plywood and foam, and he'd, he'd put that over top of this fig and then cover the ends and, and create this space that was protected. And so that was the one thing he was doing. And then the other thing was he had these boxes all over his yard, uh, these wooden boxes that were you know, maybe eight, eight feet by four feet. Uh, and it looked really funny at first. He had these potted figs standing upright, but then he showed me that what he did in the winter time was that he would tip over all of these potted figs on their sides, put a piece of foam and, and plywood over the top. And again, just creating a, a sheltered space. And uh, But so much easier than, than trying to bury fig trees every winter. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's amazing people get so creative with these things, but there's always usually a way that's a lot less work than uh, some of the things people are willing to do, which, hey, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's figs, and I, I, th I understand what people are doing it. But, um, yeah, I've heard about, actually, his method of putting the, the container figs on their side and then covering them, protecting them. Uh, it mm -hmm. makes sense that if you were to insulate the heat from the earth or heat from the ground and kind of trap that with the foam and the and the wood, that it would definitely keep the, the fig tree warmer. Um, but so, Stephen, I, I know in Canada, you know, you're definitely in a colder zone than where I am. I'm in a USDA zone 7A. And so you're in a Canada zone 6 but a USDA zone five, you said. Mm -hmm, and so right. for, for me at least, and what I know about the hardiness of figs and what a fig can really handle is that just about at around five to zero degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is obviously different in Celsius. Maybe you know what that is, Stephen, offhand. Um, I but don't, it, but I pinned up my conversion table just before we chatted. <laughs> you did? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so if we're at around uh, zero Fahrenheit, that's about uh, minus 18 Celsius. Minus 18. So uh, about that temperature is really the edge for survival and death. And usually it's, I would say it's more towards five and 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Is, ob is a better, is obviously way better than zero. I think there's a pretty good amount of figs that will survive 10. Uh, there's a much fewer amount that will survive five, and there's almost none, if very few, that will survive zero or below zero or below 18 degrees, negative 18 degrees Celsius. Um, so for those people in these places, this is really what a lot of this applies to. Now, that's an in-ground fig, right? But a potted fig is a different story. And so the wood, I, th I, I think, has a different hardiness rating. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, Stephen, um, but I'll let you chime in here in a second. But the wood, that was those were the temperatures for the branches, for the wood. But if you had a potted fig and you were to put the potted fig on its side and leave it outside all wintertime, put it in a box... Well, then the roots have a different hardiness rating. And mm -hmm. from my experience, and I've done a, a number of testing here with also with a friend of mine uh, in, in New Jersey, we've come to the conclusion that about 15 degrees Fahrenheit is you don't want to really go much below that. I think um, I had a friend that lives only 10 minutes away, and he left them out this past winter, and it got down to 10. 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so his Violet de Bordeaux survived, but one of his other trees did not. And mm -hmm. so I think there's some, some kind of um, middle ground in there between 10 and 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That's probably appropriate, but that's the general recommendation that I give people uh, is to not let their potted figs get below 15. Um, so, do you, are you seeing any differences from what I said there in terms of these temperatures, Stephen? Well, I'm, I was just thinking as you were talking about that with my potted figs, um, I am careful to move them in before things, before we get into those really cold temperatures in the winter. So right now in November, uh, we're, you know, last night it dipped down just below freezing and, and they're good, but I know that as things start getting colder, I'm, I'm worried about protecting those roots because they will freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw more when they're in a pot that's above ground right. than if they were right in the ground. Yeah. Exactly. Now, when you, so when exactly do you move them in, by the way? It depends on the year. It depends how busy life is. So I don't have a hard, fast date set on my calendar. It's always a question of, of watching the forecast. And I, I have right. to clean my garage before I move them in there too. So did <laughs> yeah. Steve get the garage clean? That always <laughs> factors into it too. <laughs> yeah. And it's a lot of work depending on how many trees you have and how big the trees are. It yeah. can get old pretty, 
fast, uh, for certain people. And I, and you know, for someone young like me, uh, it's, it's still hard work. Um, you know, carrying a five gallon size pot, like a 12 inch by 12 inch. I know I'm trying to get different conversions here, but I, I, everything I say ends up being a, something in the United States, but, um, Mm -hmm. you know, that's about a five gallon. I can carry one of those in each arm. Um, and those are about 20 to 25 pounds a piece. But if I'm, if I'm getting to a 15 gallon size pot, that's clearly, you are now approaching 75 pounds and Mm -hmm. that's one pot. And it's very difficult to carry 75 pounds for anybody. Um, but especially if you're older and, you know, not as physically fit. So what do you do? What are some of the recommendations that you have? Good question. So I have different things going on. And I think like you, I like to experiment. So I'll do something and then I'll hear about something or see it and think, oh, I have to try that too. So uh, I still have some figs in pots and that's how I started out all those years ago when I used to cram them into the basement so I still have some potted figs that go into my garage and um, pot size it it depends but I'm working up to big pots maybe up to about a half barrel size because uh, I made a decision a while ago I want fewer plants and just to let those get bigger So, so that's what I do with some of them they go into the garage and by the way my garage is insulated and I have a baseboard heater that I put on on just the coldest of nights so Mm. I I mean I could probably get away without doing that but they're my babies so I have to be careful so for for people listening who are say close to me if you have an old uninsulated frame garage it might not stay quite warm enough but if you have something that you insulate and especially if it's on a concrete pad, then good chance it'll it'll stay warm enough. So that's one thing that I do is the in the garage method. And then I do have some a couple bigger trees that I tip to the ground. So I chop the roots loose on one side. And then I, I lay them flat to the ground. I tie the branches at the top fairly tight just so it's more compact. And then it's like this hinge of roots that is remaining on the one side where I didn't cut them away. And some people look at that and they're, they're really worried. They think, wow, there's so many roots that are cut off of that fig plant. It'll die. But no, it, it's just fine. The fig is pretty resilient. And then you have this little hinge of roots. You tip it over. And what works great for me here is straw bales. So I don't bury them. And, and in a colder climate, you might want to bury them. But back to what you were saying about less work is probably better, especially as you get older. I found that I can put straw bales right on top of these fig plants that I've tipped flat to the ground. And that's all I have to do. I don't have to bury them. And Mm. I love that method because I've started doing straw bale gardening on my driveway in the summertime. And that's a whole other discussion point. But I take these straw bales that I've grown my tomatoes in all summer. And they're still good enough for insulating my figs over the winter. So that's method number two is tip to the ground covered with straw bales. That's a great method. I, I, uh, I love that because the more you can make use of that ground heat, the better off you're going to be. Mm-hmm. And people, I don't think, um, use that enough. I have a friend. Well, I had a friend, Mario, in Connecticut before he passed away. And Mario had a wealth of knowledge regarding winterizing figs and he was in a a zone six in um in the usda and so one of his methods was to to basically bend it over and then throw insulation over it he would get either concrete Mm -hmm. blankets he would buy insulation at the home depot and just throw it over top uh and so the closer it is to the ground insulating that heat it's it's got a really good chance to survive the winter steven have you had any experience wrapping your trees? No. Oh. I haven't wrapped them. I hadn't met anybody around here who wraps them successfully, so it's not something I've tried. However, I have met some people that build boxes around their fig trees, and they'll make a plywood box, usually insulated with foam, and uh, the the one person was talking about having a, a heating cable contained within there. So so there are people doing things like that. And I think 
to me, that's the exciting thing is there's so many ways that you can go about getting fig trees through the winter in a cold climate. Mm-hmm. Um, one, one other thing that I have been doing, Ross, is I decided, well, I had too many fig plants to fit into my garage one winter because everybody was sending cuttings. So you know, I kept getting more and more. I had all these fig plants. I thought, what if I had a fig hedge on the one side of my property? So I dug a trench and I stuck all my potted figs in there for the summer. And uh, and then just put a little bit of straw over the top of the pot so it masked the pots. And it looked kind of nice and ornamental. I thought, wow, that looks nice. And then in the wintertime, I had now this nice deep trench. So then I could just tip all these potted figs on their side and they're within this trench. And then it was straw over top of them. So not, nice. not unlike what Adriana was doing with the boxes, except right. lower down and now insulated by the earth. Yeah, straw is a very underutilized re- uh, resource. I find it's very insulative. I've mm-hmm. I've insulated a, a number of fruit trees, not just figs, um, outside, and I I really wasn't sure when I first started growing fruit because I had all kinds of things in containers at first, and blueberries and apples and pears and stone fruits, and I wasn't sure are they going to survive the winter or are they not, and um, so some of the things I experimented with was just grouping all the pots together, putting them up against a warm structure, like a house or a warmer building, putting them on their side and then covering them all with straw. Mm. And that was it. And it, it worked. Um, I later found out I probably didn't need any of that, but the nice part about the straw I find Stephen, and I think this is very overlooked is that, in containers, some of these trees can wake up a little bit earlier than you'd like them to because if the sun is hitting the side of the pot in, let's mm. say, very early in the spring, they can wake up prematurely. And yeah. so if you keep that straw around the the pots themselves, that can mask them from the sun, and it keeps them at a very, very stable temperature within that straw. Um so it, you end up actually having a good wake up process rather than something that could be a disaster. Um, mm-hmm. So there's many, I think, many uses for this. Uh, this year, Stephen, um, this this hedge idea it's made me think about kind of what I'm doing in that I have a lot of my figs planted very closely together. Um, they're two feet on center, three feet on center. Um, I even have one plot that's five rows, <laughs> two, it's like three feet on center. So there's no, there's not a lot of room to walk. Um, but what's nice about having them so close is that I can bend some of the branches. And so I'll take, uh, uh, you know, let's say a branch that I really like that's nice and healthy, maybe a foot and a half to three feet in length, and I'll bend it over, stake it to the ground. And, um, that way, when it's along the ground and it's still a young shoot, it's easy to move it. It's easy to, it's very pliable. And then all I do at that point is throw over straw. But and actually this year, I had a lot of wood chips delivered. And so now I'm going to be wood chipping a lot of my, my beds that have figs on them to just cover them with wood chips. Now, the added bonus is that the wood chips break down and form nice compost. and. Mm-hmm regulate the soil moisture and you know it's a lot there's a lot of big benefits there but just by bending them over and covering them with even just it's some sort of insulative material leaves straw wood chips now you can get in trouble i think with the wood chips because if it is a little bit rainy in the winter time more rain is not going to help because that rot can can occur if the bark stays wet for too long so one of the things i been doing in the past is I'll just throw a tarp over top. And so mm-hmm. by throwing a tarp over top, you keep the water off of the, the trees. And so that way they don't stay too wet and uh, there's no chance of rot. Yeah. And um, so that's, yeah, that's good. And I've, I've done something similar under the straw, but rather than a tarp, I just use an old piece of plywood mm. and um, yeah. So, but like you said, you just want to keep some of that moisture right off of the tree itself. Right. Um, and th- th- I don't know if you've experimented with this much, Stephen. Um, 
but you know, the, the, again, going back to what Mario had taught me, Mario was kind of my Adriano in a way. Mm. Um, and so he would bend over three of the branches, protect them. And then they would plop back up in the spring and in the summer. And then he would grow three new branches. And so then he would cut out the old ones, bend over the, the new ones and just keep recycling that process. Um, Okay. And it works out well. Um, what would happen, do you think, Stephen, if you didn't protect your fig? I think we'd see some pretty serious dieback most winters. Yeah, because our snow here isn't consistent. If we had good snow that would stay all winter, that would be one thing. But we we don't. So um, I think we'd get some pretty serious dieback. And so... What do you think would happen when you get this dye back? What What is the end result? Um, does your fig tree die? Does it produce the next year? Oh, so, so good question. So the roots will be fine. So the roots, I've known people who've planted figs and don't do anything, and they just die back to the ground every winter. And mm-hmm. then they re-sprout because the roots aren't killed by the, the temperatures here in my USDA Zone 5. So... But the problem is when you get that dye back, usually the next year, the plant doesn't get enough growth going soon enough to put out figs that'll ripen before the end of the season. And, and the short season really is the limiting factor mm-hmm. in, in getting those, those fruit. Right. It's, uh, it's really difficult. I can attest it, is, it has been a challenge, and I've been able to get some varieties to, to produce fruit. It's not impossible. I think a lot of light is actually the key. Um, so if it is going to die back, you have to really limit the number of trunks from the base to mm-hmm. uh, three, four, five at most. And then uh, space them well. Stake the branches. Um, and really, you should be only doing this, I think, if you got a solid eight hours of light. Uh, anything less, you're really going to struggle because it's really that light that helps set the fruit buds. But there's another component. And, uh, you know, I think what's happening, Stephen, with when they die back is that they, they are out of a hormonal balance. Um, Have you noticed, and I'm curious to see, you know, your take on this, if you prune a fig tree versus not really pruning a fig tree and the following season, how much more difficult it is to see fruit, if you prune it heavily versus you don't really prune it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, when when you prune heavily, there's a certain ratio usually of root to shoot within a plant. So if you hack it right back or if the winter kills off all that top growth, then the plant's energy will be really focused on vegetative growth Mm -hmm. rather than putting on fruit. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's just I think it's nice to mention pruning because we don't think about uh, winter dieback as a form of pruning, but it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to consider here. Um, Has anybody, you said that your friend in Canada wraps his trees and he has the the cable in there. Um, What zone is he in, do you know? So, yeah, that was somebody I, I read about here in Toronto. Okay. And so that would be the same as me in a zone five, USDA zone five. Gotcha. Okay. And, I know uh, my friend Toronto Joe. I, don't, I know mm-hmm. you know him. I know Toronto um, Joe, yeah. He's a great guy. Uh, I miss him. I miss him. I miss talking to him. He um, he has he has wrapped his trees quite successfully. Um, and I know he builds greenhouse frames now. I don't know if he's still doing it. Um, but I've seen his photos of him wrapping them Mm -hmm. to pretty extreme lengths and it works, uh, to my knowledge. Um, and I, I know he's in Toronto, but of course there's many, uh, it's not just cut and dry. Obviously if you're in Toronto, it doesn't mean you're going to succeed or not succeed. Um, so Mm -hmm. there's quite a lot. Micro microclimate comes into it in a big way too. So, Within Toronto, there's huge differences. Uh, if you're closer to Lake Ontario, you have the moderating effects of the lake. So 
So it's vastly different from where I am further away from the lake. But even within a yard, sometimes you get microclimate, say right against a brick wall, or maybe there's some, some asphalt. So you get nice heat accumulation and heat release uh, in the evening. So, so yeah, there can be so many factors that come into play. Yeah, I was actually just about to ask you, Steve, you jumped right in. That's great. Um, I, I think the microclimates is a really big deal. Um, and it's not just, I think it's important for everybody to know where these microclimates are in their yard, Mm -hmm. not, and and not even just in the sense of winter protection, but also, you know, for the spring, uh, putting them in these better microclimates that are slightly warmer than somewhere else is going to pay off typically, uh, for getting you to ripen these fruits in time. And so I think that's a big deal, um, at least for me, that's a big one that I recommend for people to do. Yeah. Um, yeah so I can think of a, a beautiful example of a microclimate. Uh, I, I was at visiting a house where they had put in a new patio and it was, it was like a dark colored slate, gray black. And, um, I was walking on this patio after the sun had gone down in bare feet and it was hot. And they had a couple fig trees there. And I was thinking, man, those are lucky fig trees because this is a perfect microclimate. Mm-hmm. You could just feel the heat coming off of this patio. So just little things like that, I think we can tune into. And I know I've messed up with microclimate in my garden. The one year I thought, oh, I'm going to put in step over figs. I just love step over figs. I'm ready for one. But I, I planted that fig tree in a part of my yard where the soil is cold and wet in the spring. Hmm. And so it just started growing too late. I just, yeah. I couldn't get it to fruit early enough. So I should have paid more attention to the microclimate. Right. It's a big deal. I always tell people, you know, figure out where the snow melts first. That's usually a good, ind- one of the indicators, mm-hmm. but of course the sun is at different positions throughout the year so it, it's good to measure this at different times of the year um and obviously the only snow is really during the winter well for the most part um is there a trick that you may know of in the summer to figure out where your warmest locations are i think it's it's just to watch the sun mm-hmm. and it's to think about some of these materials that are around your property or surfaces that will absorb heat. Uh, Think radiated heat. So brick walls, stone, paving, uh, that's really important. Absolutely. You can also take soil temperatures, uh, get yourself a thermometer, and Mm -hmm. that that pays off dividends because it's really the soil temperature that is a big factor in the metabolisms of our trees. And so the, the warmer the soil typically, especially early in the spring, the better off you're going to be later on in the season. It's almost like uh, compounding interest. Uh, so it's kind of like uh-huh. an exponential gain. Well, I think you get things going early in the spring too, don't you? The warming that soil up. Right. I try my best. There's... um. We've, I've talked a lot about low tunnels, but mm-hmm. um, also I think even planting your fig above grade can can really help with that. And um, I've been experimenting over the years. I've even planted my figs in uh, a, a container fig right into a raised bed that was a foot off the ground. And believe it or not, it survived and produced the following year. Um I think you can really get away if you if you can sort of in a way mimic what a container fig does with all that added bonus of the heat in the spring and doing that somehow in the ground by planting it higher, you can somewhat mimic what uh, a container fig does. But it's still a little bit theoretical for, in my mind because I've seen a lot of my in-ground figs now, Stephen, they have produced really at the same time as my potted figs. I have not really noticed actually much of a benefit to having a potted tree. If anything, they're now to me becoming a lot more work and a lot less worth it. Um, 
Where do you stand on all that for the container fig versus an in-ground fig? Yeah. Um, well, certainly every year when I'm moving around those pots, I think about that. Yeah. And so maybe I should tell you about my latest project. So I told you about my fig hedge. Yes. And it started out where I had these figs in pots within this trench. And then one year I, I got rid of some of my figs. So I wasn't trying to squeeze as many in there. And I thought, why don't I just plant these things permanently in there? And I'll just loosen the roots and tip them in the winter. But then they're out of the pot. They can have a bit more space. So I did that. And then last fall, I thought, hmm, what, what would this look like if I just made them all into step over figs, like very low espaliers within that trench? And then in the springtime, I could just put some glazing material over the top to heat up that trench, like the, the lids from my cold frames. So, so last fall, I hacked them all back right to the ground. Poor things. They look terrible. <laughs> but this year they've been putting on some, some new growth mm -hmm. and I'll save a couple branches on each plant that I'll train horizontally right down near the bottom of that trench. Right. And those will be my step over figs. So, so that's where my thoughts are right now with regards to potted versus in ground. I feel like I want to get to a place where I'm not moving quite as many things around every fall and spring. Yeah, I think Stephen, there's a there's a really a good balance that kind of has to occur, right? You have to really have something that you can protect that's of the right size, right? Because if it's too big, it's hard to protect. But at the same time, the more pruning that you do, typically the less fruit you get. So mm -hmm. there's a nice balance that has to occur, and so by bending over these branches, you are preserving some good solid branches with nice growing tips, lateral buds. And these tend to have an easier time fruiting and putting out more fruit. And, and that's why I think a lot of people really value wrapping is that it can yeah. preserve a lot of these growing tips that you don't have to really prune all that much. But I think if you were to prune, it would be better to not really prune the whole thing all the way back to nothing. It would be better if you could preserve something. And one of my recommendations now I just published on my blog um, is if you're really trying to control the size, you'd probably want to remove something at the base. You wouldn't want to do a lot of detailed thinning cuts or heading cuts higher up in the canopy. You'd probably want to focus lower down and remove a scaffold or remove a trunk and that can help control the size. Um, so I like your idea, Stephen. My one concern is actually rodents. And so mm. when you have these, and it really it's any, any method of protection, right? Um, we didn't mention this. Do you do you have much rodents that show up uh, in your yard? But that's the million dollar question, right? Especially with <laughs> straw, because we were talking about straw. Yeah. And if I was a rodent, I'd be saying, "Man, straw and fig bark, right? I'm I'm moving in." Yep. So w what I do is I don't put any straw anywhere near my figs mm -hmm. until I'm I'm well into November. It's cold out, and I'm waiting for those mice to go move in somewhere else. They'll, I want them to move into my neighbor's garden. Right. And, and uh, I'm not setting up any kind of accommodation for them yet. So when it comes to covering them and insulating them, I don't rush. I know some people, as soon as we get into October, they're eager to put away the figs. But yep. don't rush because yes. you're just creating rodent residences. It's really one of the best tips, I think. It really is. Do not rush. I think a lot of people get hung up. I mean, it's not just about the rodents. It's about also making sure your tree is truly dormant as well. Yeah. What do you say about that? I mean, because if it's not dormant and you put it away, you're going to have some problems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know I've, I've talked to people who were picking the leaves off their fig trees before putting them in the garage because they hadn't dropped yet. Mm -hmm. New fig growers that are just learning. And I said, nope, leave them out. Let those leaves drop off because you want that tree to be fully dormant. You don't want to put it away if it's not yet dormant. So, yeah, really important. Right. So my recommendation is to tell people 
if you see that 15 degree low, well, then you should start doing something. And that for, if that forecast comes up 15 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the time. Okay, I got to act. I got to do something. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, life events come in. It's typically we have to do this around the holidays, right? There's Thanksgiving, Christmas. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. well, for you, I don't know if you guys have Thanksgiving, of course. Uh, Our Thanksgiving's in October. So, yeah, we, we've got okay. a different window, but... Mm-hmm. So it's still, it's yeah. the same thing. I mean, we we all have lives and we all have different circumstances, but certainly you, you want to wait. You want to wait as much as you can because if the trees are not dormant as well, mm-hmm. you're going to struggle because they're going to wake up too soon in the spring. And depending on where you have them, if they're in the garage like you have your figs, well then they're not going to get much light. And so mm-hmm. if they're awake in January. Yeah, you're still really far away from, you know, from spring and sunlight and the figs need sunlight to really perform Mm -hmm. well that season. And so if they're in a warmer environment, this is the other thing I think people really get hung up on. Where do you put the figs, Stephen? If you have a container fig, we talked about, you know, what to do if you got some in-ground figs, you put yours in the garage, but you don't want it in a too warm of a place, do you? No, that's such a good point because too warm. And as you said, they wake up early and usually there's not enough light and in, in some kind of storage location. So you get this lanky growth that is really good for nothing. So you want somewhere cool. Uh, if you have, say, um, a sunroom or a three season room, sometimes that can be good. And maybe they'll come out of dormancy earlier, but they're in that protected space. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I told you about my first house. We had this really cold washroom in the basement, so I could keep them dormant there. A cold cellar, a garage. Um, Cellars are great. Or if you don't have any of those spaces, though, maybe it makes sense to look at keeping that fig tree somewhere out of doors, but in a protected space. So there's a a guy that I was in touch with in Alberta in a USDA Zone 3 who was uh, telling me, so normally there that that the potted fig trees just need to go to a protected space in the winter because it's cold. But he was playing around with this idea of burying it, and he found that if he buried his fig tree right next to the foundation of his house, there was enough heat escape from the foundation that it worked. (laughs) <laughs> so so I wow. think it's just, you have to be creative and you have to think about, okay, so what do I have in my particular situation that, that's an opportunity? Right. That's not going to break your back um, and be less work, but you can mm-hmm. also make a decision that is the wrong decision. I think that's really the problem, unfortunately, sometimes is that people, they think they, they're doing the right thing. So there's a, there, there has to be a learning curve, unfortunately, sometimes with this. And so we can give you guys the best advice possible. But, uh, you know, it, it just is a, it's almost at the same time um, something you just have to try. You have to see what's going to happen. Mm, for sure. Um, you know, I do you know, think – sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say on that note you were talking about you just have to try – and uh, there was one guy that got in touch with me from Quebec City, which is a really cold city. And uh, he was determined to grow figs and on a balcony nonetheless. And I said, Maurice, like, I don't put much hope into this. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Give me an update. And I'm trying to think what zone he is. I think he's maybe zone four. Anyway, it's cold. Um, he's been sending me pictures of his fig harvest because he figured out, uh, he, he played around with varieties Yeah, he found one that works best. And uh, I think it's Ron de Bordeaux for him. Nice mm. early fig. Nice. And, uh, he found that he has to start them out early indoors under lights. And then he has to bring some of them in, in the fall to continue the ripening under lights. But he played around and he figured out something that'll work in his situation, which is a, a balcony in a really cold city. So I think if, if people are creative, you can find a way to do it. Wow. That's amazing. Um, that's incredible. I t- hats off to that guy, Maurice, shout out to Maurice, man. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> I'm telling you that would drive me nuts, but he was determined and he did it. Um, I, I do think there, there can be back, going back to the mistake part of this, there can be mistakes that are made. And I think it really is actually, 
of the limits of a fig. You you don't want them to get too cold, but you also don't want them to be too warm. And so yeah, if they're too warm in the winter, we talk a lot about the cold aspect, but that basement typically, that unheated basement that a lot of people have, I find most of them are a little too warm. It depends on the house, depends on where you are. I've heard a lot of bad basement stories. Um, so I just would be very careful about really what you want to do is put them in a, an area that stays as cold as possible for as long as possible. So about 15 degrees is the lowest Fahrenheit, but you don't want to really be above 45 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit for extended periods of time. And so if that's happening in January and February, as Stephen mentioned, you get this spindly growth that comes out in the darkness. Yeah. And your season is, is assuredly, it's really in jeopardy, almost ruined. Um, so I just, yeah, I would highly recommend that people definitely focus on that. Um, picking the spot and, and, uh, it may be a little inconvenient, but I think most of the time putting it in your basement is, uh, is actually a lot of work. If you think about it, you gotta go all these down, all these yeah. steps. Um, so yeah. Uh, um, and as you're talking about that, I'm, I'm just thinking about uh, another scenario I've seen. I have a neighbor who's got a, a concrete deck behind his house. And there's this space underneath there where he can put his, he has to tip the fig flat, but it's this space that it's dark. There's no light getting in there to warm it up. It's all concrete and stone and it stays really cool, hmm. um, but yep. it doesn't get super cold. So that fig tree survives. So that kind of space is definitely better than a basement of a centrally heated house because that's the challenge in a centrally heated house usually we mm -hmm. don't get cold corners of basements like say an old farmhouse where you have earthen floor and wall and there's no heat in the basement it could be beautiful right but uh yeah i totally agree uh the the idea of what you just said about the the concrete is it's almost like a root cellar in a way mm -hmm. um and but root cellars and, and wine cellars can be varying as well. And it, it's not you can't just say every wine cellar, every root cellar is going to work out. Um, because I actually I find the deeper you go, the worse it can become because it's typically warmer. Um, now that concrete area that that gentleman had that you mentioned that wasn't very deep, and so I have a very similar situation where I store almost all of mine is in a very root cellar type environment, which is below our sunroom. We have a, a storage a storage area that's right below our unheated sunroom, but the sunroom obviously warms up during the, uh, the day, mm -hmm. but heat rises. And so in this root cellar area, the earth is putting out this heat and it's rising, but there's a, there's a floor to the sunroom, right? So the floor is basically trapping in this heat and creating this environment that not only in the winter is stable, but also in the summer it's stable. And, um, but that's the problem. If, if it, if it was really deeper, I find, I would imagine in, you know, this is maybe only six inches to a, f not, not even really, it's almost pretty much at grade level. It's not really any deeper than grade if you had a root cellar that was three to six feet deep, that may be too warm actually in the winter time. Um, and because the, st the, the temperatures of the earth become more and more stable, the deeper you go. Lower um, down you are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot, a lot to consider. And I, um, I really want to thank Stephen here for joining us. Um, it was obviously, this is, I think covering pretty much everything. And I hope that, we can really put this information out so you guys can be prepared this winter. Um, Steven, again, he's on um, foodgardenlife.com. I'll put that link down in the description. He's also got two books, uh, Grow Figs Where You Think You Can't. And uh, the other one is Grow... What's the other one, Growing, Steven? Growing Figs in Cold Climates, 150 of your questions answered. Perfect. And so, Stephen, before we go, uh, do you want to say anything to the audience? Do you want to plug anything else? Uh, give you the floor. 
Well, thanks, Ross. I really, uh, the key message I think uh, for people, from my perspective, when it comes to getting fig trees through cold winters, it just back to that whole creativity element because every house is different and what each gardener can do is different. So, um, so really think about that and, and look at all your options. Yeah, perfect. There you go, guys. So, again, thank you, Stephen, for joining us. Uh, everybody else, thanks for watching. Check out uh, my blog as well, figboss.com. Hit that subscribe button. We'll see you guys for more fig-related interviews, and um, we'll see you guys for the next one. Take care.